I was raised here like it was New York in the 1940s. Like we sat on the stoop, we played, you know, hit the penny. We, I was telling my kids, an activity when I was a child was just to go somewhere and sit on a bench and watch people. And they're and like, hit a, and hit a penny. I no, don't know what that like, game is. You, you threw okay, that one in okay, like, big man, oh, with your everyone. Knicks poster, hit the penny as two people stand across from each other. I a, once saw a seven foot four guy step into <laughs> a hit the penny game, and I said, "He's slow." You can but then play. He started hit the, hitting, you, then he started hitting the penny from, and I'll go, "Okay, <laughs> this wanna, guy's good." Do you want to hear what hit the penny is or not? Um, I actually don't really okay. care. Can I anyway, can I ask so, you another question? Though? Yes. Do you think that? <laughs> Do you think you're um, better because I grew up without money? Yes. <laughs> but do you think that you're that you are against um, nice things? Spon- yes. Spontaneity because your parents seemed so spontaneous. <laughs> oh. oh, Dr. Greenfield here <laughs> lay down on the couch. Thank you. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two So now she's gonna break down It's a breakdown She's gonna break it down Hi, I'm Ian Bialik And welcome to my breakdown This is a place where we break things down That need to be broken down We're gonna talk to someone today Who's a very, very, very funny person He's been nominated Wow, he's nominated for a Golden Globe Um, Max Greenfield Who you may know from New Girl uh, nominated for an Emmy, Golden Globe, Critics' Choice Award. He was Schmidt on New Girl. Very um, funny. Very, very funny. He also is, uh, since 2018, he's Dave Johnson in uh, the CBS comedy series The Neighborhood, which stars Cedric the Entertainer. Um, Max has also written two children's books. The first is called I Don't Want to Read This Book, which is a great way to get, especially young people who don't want to read books, to read a book. And his new one is called This Book Is Not a Present. He's very funny. And he and I were on James Corden a minute ago. And we happened to be there right before the Jewish New Year began, uh, the holiday of Rosh Hashanah. And um, Max is Jewish. and I'm Jewish. And Corden was talking to me about the New Year. And I thought, Max is sitting right here. Why don't we all talk about it? And it became uh, something that has been shared many, many times by a lot of people. Uh, Max and I did a an impromptu shofar service, um, which is the ceremonial object that is blown uh, in synagogue. And uh, a lot of people really, really enjoyed it. He's hilarious. There's a way that Max and I, before I get to that, the person that also I speak special with, Jonathan Cohen. <laughs> you really snuck that one I in totally there. You did. Because someone mentioned to me, Jonathan, that what Max and I did, the way that we spoke, is a very particular style of, in particular, Jewish comedy. Uh, it's which, a... So it, it's, it's, it's what happens when two people are talking. I mean, it's a deliberate... Over each other. It, but it's not just over each other. It's overlapping. And it's is a that, ping pong. And it's a back and forth. <laughs> Keep you're, going. You're not doing it like Max does. What it is, I literally just blinked and my left eye didn't open <laughs> when I opened my eyes. Sometimes Sasha leaves eyelash glue on my eyes even after we take my makeup off. And, but I literally blinked and then it was just like, what? okay. Anyway. But like what, when that happens, there's a split second where you're like, my eye will never open again. It's just like that now. Right. For one second, I was like, this is it. You're like, that muscle that has been working my whole life has finally just tapped the, out. Now I'm with that chameleon from the Sing movies. It had a certain number of openings, and it's done now. It's like, just the left one. The right's like, I got a couple more in me. <laughs> anyway, so Max Greenfield and I. So we did something, which is just because I, I, I would argue that it is an East Coast Jew. I would maybe even say not all of North America East Coast. It happened in the Catskills. It, <laughs> it, it is. It is a, a Borscht Belt style um, that, that was popular in the Yiddish theater. Do you think that is but, the let me only explain it. Okay. fake shofar blowing that's ever been on a late night show? <laughs> Can we get some research on that? I, it might be the only shofar blowing without a shofar on a late night show. I, I mean, don't even having, know that any late night shows have had a shofar. I wanted to bring a shofar on Corden. And the but instead you brought like, your good attitude. Anyway. The style of speaking that we were doing, somebody mentioned it to me that it's like it is it, it's a, it's an overlapping. It's not just like, oh, they're cutting each other off. It's like a, he talks like that and then she does that. And, and it that's was, what I was saying. Yeah. 
Anyway, I didn't realize it because that's just like so germane to how I speak when I speak with other people. Are you trying to replace me because he has a nicer smile than I do? <laughs> it's, it's not just his smile. <laughs> his eyes, too. It's, yeah. You know what he looks like? He looks like if Tom Cruise were from Dobbs Ferry. <laughs> He reminds me of like, like the childhood image I had of Tom Cruise, meaning like when I was young and like Risky Business came out and I was like, that face, right? Like that's, I think, what he stirs in people or not. Anyway, it was a real, real, real joy to get to have this like Rosh Hashanah moment with Max Greenfield on, on Corden. And um, we talked to him backstage and I wouldn't have spoken to him if you weren't there because I'm very shy and I always think people don't want to talk to you and you're like, let's say hi to him. And I introduced you and we were all like talking and then he and I texted and then we totally asked him if he would come and play. So this is our interview with Max Greenfield. And before we do that, we'll just congratulate Mayim on making a friend. I would like to be friends with him. And he also sounds, I don't know, he sounds like a, a cool dad. It sounds like- I want to meet have, Joey the dog. He talks about his dog. All right, let's just welcome him because a super, super- Funny guy, Max Greenfield, welcome to The Breakdown. So spontaneous. Break it down. Go Nix. Go Nix. Jalen Brunson. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, you had a moment there when uh, Jeremy Lin was on fire for about four and a half minutes. <sighs> <laughs> I was watching that seven foot four, the second pick, the second, what's it called? Prospect? Yeah. What's his name? Victor Wembanyama. I can't even. Like, first I'm watching... And I'm like, whatever. He's kind of slow. Like he looks like he's a little bit in slow motion. And then he like turns and around and does like. Clearly, you're a scout. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then he starts like sinking threes from the outside. And then he's got like a baseline jumper. And he's like Patrick Ewing meets any 15 year old on a basketball court. I like that it was like the first G League game to ever be televised. And Mayim turned in, <laughs> tuned in, and was like, I don't know. <laughs> no, but I kept watching, and then I was like, oh my god, that. That's seven foot, seven four, right? Yeah, seven. I'm four. like, he can really move, and he did like a, he did like a little like a little fake. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, he moves so slow, but it's amazing. Maya was like, I don't, I don't, I want to see it. <laughs> it was that game where he's playing the number one. What's his name? Uh, Peterson. It's, I don't know numbers, Anderson? but yes, he yeah. was playing the number one. Anyway. Anyway. Lost. Henderson. That's <laughs> it's they're one and two. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to give you a quick, okay, Victor Wembanyama, the big tall one the seven, who, can four move, who, who, moves, who moves slow, but, but shoots threes. Um, he, that, that's your scouting report. He, um, he's like, he's the number one guy. And then he was playing against this guy, Scoot Henderson, who's number two. Oh, I thought Henderson was number one. That's what I thought too. Oh, the, They're switching. It. I blame you. This is the best sport show ever, actually. I... <laughs> We anyway. say what we think okay. we mean, and Max, Max explains it how it actually is. Max, first of all, welcome. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. You're going to to sell your podcast to The Ringer. This and <laughs> well, and the, um, the reason you're this hear is Bill Simmons be like this. The I reason know this it's, is it's, amazing is because this is the result of something that I never do, which is anything spontaneous. And we were on the Corden show, and Jonathan was like, "He's so cool. He's so funny. Like, shouldn't we have him on?" And Jonathan was like, ask him. And I was like, no, I couldn't. He'll say no. He'll think I'm stupid. He's like every boy at Jewish camp that was like, you're not pretty enough. Anyway, I texted you. <laughs> but he <laughs> and he's going to do it. And we're talking to him. Are you not spontaneous? You don't like no. uh, spur of the moment stuff? You like, <laughs> you're very planned. I mean, as long as it's on the schedule, she'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm, I am not, I'm not spontaneous, which is why I don't really excel in the fields of, say, improv, you know, uh, telling anecdotes on a show. Like, you you got an anecdote, you're ready to go. Except when Corden asked you, what are you going to do to celebrate the 100th episode? And you're like, I don't know. Yeah, that was a big one for that me. Wasn't it was a good, tough. That wasn't a good question for him to ask. But no, I don't excel at spontaneity. Okay, all right. We were together just before the beginning of the Jewish New Year which I think some people learned about for the very first time by seeing us on Corden. Can I tell you how much my holidays in synagogue were interrupted by people telling me that they thought what you and I did, which was spontaneous, was the greatest thing to, possibly the only good thing to happen for the Jews in a minute and a half. 
Did you get stopped at synagogue or did you not go to synagogue and it wasn't an issue? So uh, my dad, who I said on the show, is like, oh, this is going to be my dad's favorite thing that I've ever done in entertainment. Um, he, I said, you're going to like this. You want to watch it? And so he watched it. And sure enough, <laughs> I was not lying. Oh, he said, he goes, oh, people are loving this. <laughs> And he showed me his phone and it was like he, he had gotten 13 responses from the 13 people that he sent it to in New York. And he goes, look at this. Look at this. And he showed me his phone. It was just like, oh, I guess. All right. He go, all the East Coast is going crazy. <laughs> all 13 of them. The entire the entire they're going nuts. Did he miss got- all the seasons of New Girl? <laughs> Oh, my! he's like my wife. They, there's like two things that they've ever pointed to that I've ever done that are like this. Very, very not bad. Pretty good. <laughs> and that was it. My, 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 the four minutes on Corden I did on the show far, my dad was like, finally, he, he did something. <laughs> also, the title of this episode will be Max Greenfield. My dad is just like my wife. My wife is, I think, only once ever watched something that I've been in and said, nah, that's funny. <laughs> and I can tell you what it was. It was like a Paul Shear adult swim show <laughs> where I was doing and I was trying to do a British accent, but it was more Australian. It was like a mix between Australian and British. I'm like, so I'm not that talented. And, uh, and then we did it. And it was like an 11 minute adult swim show that pa- Paul Shear is the funniest person on earth. Yep. Um, and, uh, and my and we watched it. And my wife, I remember my wife turned and she goes, "Now that's funny." I'd just been nominated for an Emmy. Also, your wife knows which <laughs> your wife your wife knows what she's talking about. Like she's I know, like, I she's know a professional. Her from the, she's literally a professional person who tells people if they're good or not. Like I've worked with her, she gets to tell me if I'm good or not. Um, that's gotta hurt. That's <laughs> very intense. Mind the Alex breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. We use Athletic Greens daily. I, in particular, was that person who took a million different pills to try and, like, fill all the gaps in my diet. But with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you get 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports gut health, your immune system, your nervous system, your energy, recovery, focus, everything. It's lifestyle-friendly. I love that. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, you're dairy-free, gluten-free, trying to watch your sugar, there's no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial anything, and tastes good. AG1 is a micro habit with macro benefits. It's something you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. Right now, reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. One scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. You don't need a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash breakdown. Again, athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. When you are at your best, guess what? You can do great things, but life can bog you down sometimes. We all get overwhelmed. I often don't show up the way that I want to, but I have found that working with a therapist helps get me closer to the best version of me that I can be. And when we feel empowered, we are more prepared to take on everything that life throws at you. And life's going to throw a lot at you. Give therapy a try. BetterHelp's a great option. It's affordable, flexible, convenient. It's all online. All you have to do is fill out a questionnaire. You're matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch at any time for no charge. Live a more empowered life. Therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today. Get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. I'm just curious. Um, we, we did a bit of, you know, fun, just like looking articles up and things. A lot of people think you're gay, but you're you're not, which is totally your prerogative. I'm, to fine, be I'm fine either way. Exactly. It really but I'm curious, how did you meet your wife? Were you, I don't know what point in your career and like, like, how is that? It was, <laughs> it was a very, it was a long time ago. It was in, gosh, it was nearly 20 years ago. I think it was 2003. Um, and we were out at a bar and she was there with some friends. I was there with a friend of mine and my friend had dated for a, very short period of time, one of her friends that she was with, and he was like, oh, there's Farah. And I go, and I was like, oh, 
Um, <laughs> I go, her friend, her friend's, her friend's pretty. And, so, <laughs> and then I guess she felt the same way about me. She thought I was pretty as well. Um, and we made eyes. And then um, 20 years later, we're still here. That's he, sweet. He's describing a meet cute from a rom-com. I don't understand what meet cute is. This is a thing. I don't know that expression. Okay. It was in a script. And I literally was like, what's this mean? What does that mean? What's a meet cute? I you I mean you asked me like I know I don't is it I don't a know. noun like we had a meet cute no it's like a trope in rom coms where you two characters some, yeah. see each other from across the room the camera slows down the light hits them just right their eyes meet they both think that each other is pretty and then they fall in love and the movie goes on that sort of was that that honestly You're that's a pretty a good description <laughs> yeah it was nice it was. We were obviously into each other. And then it was one of those things where it just slowly got better and better and better and sort of continues to. What I heard is you had sex and then decided to have another date and then you actually <laughs> liked each other. Got it. And then we had some babies that got married. You have two babies? We have two. Oh, they're not babies. I know. Well, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have our daughter, Lily, who is uh, now almost 13, and uh, our son, who is seven. If there's, it's an interesting spread. Yeah, that actually is. Uh, mine are under three years apart. Jonathan has a swing and single, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Are, are you from, you're from Dobbs Ferry? New York, correct. I have family that whole region, but I specifically have family in Dobbs Ferry. Um, really? Yeah, no, my parents are from uh, the South Bronx. Uh, they were born during oh, World yeah. War II. But then, you know, we kind of scattered, like you do. My my dad moved to the island of Long in uh, 1957 or something, that was like the Jewish dream was to leave the tenement houses of the Bronx. Um, anyway, so yeah, one of my dad's cousins um, was in Dobbs Ferry and you know, I have family kind of, you know, all that area. But you grew up out here, right? I grew up, my mother was nine and a half months pregnant. I think it might've been a fight that my parents had because like she had like the four year old and was very pregnant and was here and he was there, uh, yeah. I was born in San Diego where my mom's parents were living. We didn't have anywhere to live. We were living in their living room. And then we moved up to L.A. and stayed with other friends. My parents were uh, documentary filmmakers and bohemians. But, yeah, I was raised here like it was New York in the 1940s. Like we sat on the stoop. We played, you know, hit the penny. We, I was telling my kids an activity when I was a child was just to go somewhere and sit on a bench and watch people. And, they're and, like, hit a, and hit a penny? I no, don't know what that like, game is. You, you threw okay, that one in okay, like, Okay, big man oh, with your every... next poster. Hit the penny as two people stand across from each other. I a... once saw a seven foot four guy step into <laughs> yes. a hit the penny game and I said, he's slow. You can but play then, he started hit the... hitting, you... then he started hitting the penny from low and I'll go, okay, <laughs> this guy's good. Do you want to hear what hit the penny is or not? Um, I actually don't really okay. care. Can I, <laughs> anyway, can I ask so... you another question though? Yes. Do you think... Then, do you think you're um, better because I grew up without money? Yes. <laughs> but do you think that you're that you are against um, nice things? Spon yes. Spontaneity because your parents seemed so spontaneous. <laughs> oh. oh, Dr. Greenfield here <laughs> lay down on the couch. Thank you. Um. So what's interesting, my, my dad uh, of blessed memory, he um, he was very um, he was very artistic. He was, you know, much more kind of out there. My mom was the, the more grounded one of the two. She, you know, as she said, like she would kind of like pick up the pieces of the documentary film that he was like, I can't finish. I can't be a success or a failure. So she would kind of pick up the pieces. And my mom was a list maker. My mom's a first generation American and like was raised basically to be someone's servant, also known as wife in the generation that she was. So she's very, very organized, very like we had, you know, we washed our pillowcases every Saturday. We washed sheets and pillowcases every other Saturday. Like we had a day where she mended all of my doll's clothing by hand and we would wash everything and put it on the line. I'm, I grew up in the 1940s and one day you're gonna wonder what hit the penny is because you'll be with your kids somewhere and all you'll have is a Spalding ball and a penny and you'll be like, what do we do? So short answer, yes. Short answer, yes. But no, but I was, I had this whole conversation with my kids because they were like, so we were driving somewhere and I was telling them about 
this activity that my family would do. And they're like, so did you eat like dinner before? No, we didn't have money to go have dinner that frequently. They're like, did you, was there any activity? Were you going to the movie? I said, no, we would pick a place <laughs> to go and sit on a bed. They said, would you have like a, an ice cream? I said, what are you fucking crazy? No, you just sit on the bench. How do you, you know when people. it's over? Someone gets bored or my parents get into parents a fight. <laughs> Do you ever was like, do you ever go, hey, I don't, I'm not into this. Oh, I'm sorry. You mean, did I ever think that voicing something that I wanted or needed would be helpful? No. Okay, got it. Got it. <laughs> and my parents also like they were they were they were, a you know, they were a riot. They were fun. They were like the life of the party. They were great dancers. They were they dressed amazing. They were a gorgeous couple. Like Me and my brother were like their troll children, like. See those attractive people doing the Lindy? My dad would be like spinning her around and we come in like Quasimodo. <laughs> Sorry. And then how was it how is it for you when your kids are like, I don't want to sit on a bench? Um, not good because <laughs> I, you know, I'm still programmed to to think the way, you know, parents and children were set up. It's been, you know, it's been a real, a real battle, you know, and there, my parents gave us also a tremendous amount of love. But I really did grow up believing that, like, what I say goes. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, you have an opinion? So what I've had to learn with this progressive wave of parenting that we are part of and the holistic way of thinking is, I hear that you don't want to sit on this bench. <laughs> I'm not able to change the plans. And your choices are <laughs> you can sit here and cry or you can go over there and cry where it's less annoying. <laughs> it's it's tough. It's I find myself... Really, like, because there's t sometimes where I'll, where I'll have that conversation where I'll be like, you know what? I understand you don't want to sit on the bench right now and let's figure out a different option. And then there's other times where I maybe I haven't gotten some sleep. I'm tired. I've got some other stuff going on in my life. And I'm just sort of like, you know, not, re not ready to have that conversation. Like, are you going to sit on the fucking bench? <laughs> and, <laughs> and what it's, and what, what I find disappointing is that it's led to inconsistent parenting. And that really is where I ultimately have found that I've, I've, I've dropped the ball. For so long, I was doing, I, I felt like I was really nailing the parenting thing. And then I was like, ooh, that was off. That's probably confusing to the child to see you like that. Well, you know what's confusing to the parent? That they're each people with individual personalities and they become cognizant and sensitive and vulnerable as humans a lot earlier than I expected. So I was never really like, oh, I can't wait to have babies. Like, not really a baby person. Even now, people are like, look at my baby. Eh, it looks like a little old man, and it's going to cry all night and shit all over you. But my kids, like, I, I you know, I, I did. I turned my life, you know, over to them. I wasn't working at the time. I was in grad school. Like, I was the milk source, the everything source. But, like, around three or four, they emerged as, like, oh, they have a sense of humor. They understand. Like, they make sarcastic jokes. Like, they're funny. And, and then I realized, oh, you can't just like do anything you want and take pictures of them and think that that's your job. <laughs> yeah. I also think they they one day figure out to some extent who you are. Yes. And um, and that that's a tough one because they they've pinned me as a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that what you is that who they what they figured out? Both of them. <laughs> <laughs> so. Give us an example. How are you a sucker? Well, I just, I just, I, I feel like what I, what I've done as a parent and I've come to accept this because I don't think I could have done it any other way is they come out and you're like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing that's, that's ever been brought into this world. And I, I just, I love them. I love them, love them, love them. I love my daughter, love my son. And then at some point, some shifts and they're like, Ugh. they go, I don't know, I don't need this anymore. And I'm like, I'm cool with it. That's fine. Do, do your thing. <laughs> but then they know how to go back. Oh yeah. To the, but then, <laughs> and I'm an idiot. Right. And ev every time I'm like, oh, well, what? What, what do you need now? <laughs> and then I'm mad, like a little bit mad because 
I thought we were done with this. And mm-hmm. I thought you didn't. And then it becomes a melodrama where it's just like, you know, goes back and forth. Well, if, you know, if this is, if we're going to go back to this relationship, one, I'm somewhat excited, but also, you know, you've got to pick a lane here. Mm. I remember but like, one but of it the- all, it always ends up with fine. What do you need? <laughs> How much is it? When do you need it by? Yeah. I remember in um I mean it's different for every kid and I'm always embarrassed to say, you know, like when when my kids started to pull away cuz you know those friends when you're like, yeah, my kids kind of pull away. That hasn't happened for us. Must be something you're doing. I'm like, maybe it's just, you know, and then you stay up all night thinking like, how have I traumatized this child and he doesn't want to be around me. Um I was once reading an article when Miles was probably 10 or 11 about the pheromones of a mother, like the the unconscious smells that ladies can produce. And I, I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about un- that, especially to developing boys, like in the pre-puberty, puberty, that smell becomes offensive, meaning unconsciously. And I was ta- talking to somebody and Miles was overhearing this and I was you know, just telling about this article <laughs> from the backseat I hear. Yeah, I think that's actually what's happening. <laughs> You're acknowledging that you feel disdain for me, but at least you know that you're supposed to love me enough to pretend like it's pheromones that you, um, but I remember the first time like after that when they just get like like a cold or a little flu and they get all cuddly and uh. all they want is like to like, and, and I remember I'd be like, oh, you're not feeling well? That's so bad, oh! And I'd be like, we're gonna have a daytime nap like the old days. <laughs> And I would yeah. take pictures of them. I would like rock them to sleep and then do like creepy mom thing of like, look, like I put them down for a nap without breastfeeding. It's so great. Now I'm just really into dogs. Instead of children? Yeah, it's left a whole, I have, I have time now. Oh. You know, what? They're, bu- they're busy. They don't want to be with me. So now I'm just, I spend a lot of time with my dog. What kind of dog do you have? <laughs> oh, I got a great dog. His name is Joey. He's a big old, he's a big old pit bull, uh, oh. American bully mix. Oh, what does that mean? He is a, there's a, uh, he's a, we did, we did a DNA of test. Of course you did. He was, he, <laughs> he was, uh, he's 60% pit bull, 63% pit bull and whatever that, I can't do the math right now, but the rest of it is American bully. You know, those kind of dogs, we had to look it up and Amer- it's not a bulldog. You know those dogs that are like really muscular? It looks like they gave them a bunch oh, of steroids. It's like a cartoon dog. Yeah. That kind of dog. Which those dogs are bred to be family dogs. They look really scary. They're the sweetest dogs on earth. They do. It looks like a cartoon dog of like the tough dog on the block. Pitbulls, I here's another piece of information that I probably read wrong. Are oh were originally called the nanny dogs because they took care of children. Oh. Sweet, sweet dogs. Any event, Joey's the greatest. You would love him. I like that his name's Joey. He's just like the dude on the block. Well, that was, that was the name that he had when we got him. We rescued him during COVID. You did a mitzvah in rescuing that dog. Thank you. Well, I don't know. Maybe he rescued us. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you got him over COVID? That's how bad COVID was for you? You got a dog? <laughs> My kids tricked me. Uh, and you they, said, okay. They, of course, just like, <laughs> yes. So we were locked in our house and they had been begging and begging and begging for a dog, specifically my daughter. And finally, um, I said, if we were ever going to do it, this is the time to do it. And so you could foster a dog. And so I called <laughs> I called this wonderful place called Wags and Walks, which is here in LA. It's in Culver City. And uh, I spoke to this wonderful woman named Erica. And I said, Erica, here's the deal. Um, I've got kids. I, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try to do this. Um, I'm not going to be a good dog owner. Um, it's questionable who the alpha in the house is, if anyone, um, I'm not going to train a dog. I, it just, it's not, I, that's not in my nature. It'll train me. Um, and I just need you to guarantee me to the best of your ability that it's not going to be aggressive uh, towards a child. Cause we have children coming in and out of this house. Uh, anything else? I don't care. We'll take whatever you got. And she goes, you need Joey. Oh. And I go, okay. So she sends us this mug shot of this, like, you know, rough looking dog. <laughs> and I showed it to my daughter and my daughter was like, no way. <laughs> 
And so, you know, she wanted some like little lap dog, some cute little thing. And I was like, we're, I don't I don't know that that's going to happen. Um, and so we convinced her a week later. I think I was like, I think we should go meet Joey. So we went down to meet Joey and I was at my height of sort of neuro- like neuroses. And I was like, we are not taking Joey home. <laughs> I go, we are going to go meet Joey. I said, we're going to feel this out, see what it's like. And then we're going to leave. <laughs> And we'll talk about it. And then we will revisit Joey just to see if it's the same dog that we met on the first. Because you don't want to take somebody home. The, you, the, you, anyway, so I'm like screaming at them in my uh, in the car on the way down there. And my wife, they're all like, what is his problem? We get down there. Joey comes over to us. We're sitting there. He's the greatest dog on earth. And within five minutes, my wife looks up at them and goes, uh, well, we're going to take him home. <laughs> And, and, and she looked at me and I went, I just don't see how we can. <laughs> and so Joey got in the car with us and it was the best day of my life. <laughs> wow. Have you had a dog before? We've had, well, I, I had a dog growing up um, named Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill was an asshole. <laughs> um, no connect, no, we just didn't, we didn't connect. We never connected. Um and then my parents rescued a dog later in life named Alice, and Alice was a sweetheart. But I was at an age where I was probably too much into myself to really understand how great Alice was. Um, I was like early 20s at that point. And then Joey was the next dog that came into our life and changed, you know, just changed everything. <laughs> Softened us all up. That's very sweet. We're warming up. We're We're warming up. We're we're on the the long term plan for trying to get a dog, like maybe in ten years we'll get a dog. Just waiting for the cats to die. Go. You're waiting for my cats to die. I okay. didn't want to say it like that, but I I was waiting. Oh, you for have, them. How many cats do you have? I have three. I had four, but one died over COVID. Four is oh, the tipping sad. point. Four is the tipping point. Like three that's... now. Is do like... the cats? Do they do they run outside? No, we don't do outside cats. They're house. They're house cats. Yeah. Well, I had. The greatest cat I've ever had was Esau, and he was a hairless wonder, and he lived to 12. That's pretty and good. And he, he was very special and had no hair, but little peach fuzz on his <laughs> paws. He was ridiculous. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by Rocket Money. I learned something interesting. The average person has around 12 paid subscriptions. Think about that. If you think you're only subscribed to a handful of services, you might want to double check. With Rocket Money, you can quickly identify and cancel all of your unwanted subscriptions. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions that they've forgotten about, like that streaming service that you bought to watch that one show or the free trial that you never even used. Rocket Money quickly and easily identifies your subscriptions for you, so you can stop paying for the ones you don't want. I am that person who used to have a million subscriptions. This is the solution. It feels so good to know that you are no longer throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash breakdown. That's rocketmoney.com slash breakdown. Rocketmoney.com slash breakdown. My and Beyond's Breakdown is supported by ZocDoc. If you're like me, you've got like that health problem that you're not taking care of and you're about to like text all your friends in a group chat to say like, what do I do? You're unlikely to find quality medical advice in your group chat, I promise, but you can find it on ZocDoc from a doctor. Thousands of medical professionals on ZocDoc are there to help you. They listen like a friend and give you the expert care you need. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them and treat any condition under the sun. No more Dr. Roulette. No more looking for reviews that are questionable on the internet. With ZocDoc, it's a trusted guide to connect you to your favorite doctor that you haven't met yet. Millions of people use ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who's patient-reviewed and fits their needs and their schedule just right. Go to ZocDoc.com breakdown. Download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's ZocDoc.com breakdown. ZocDoc.com slash breakdown. Would you like to ask Max some of the questions that we thought would be fun to ask him? 
we've covered some of them, but Max, we were prepping for this interview. And we were like, what are we going to talk to Max about? And I was like, this is why we shouldn't do anything spontaneous. I need three months to prepare to speak to Max. So we just started jotting a list of random questions. Just things. The first one is is like, there, there's no order to these either. No. So like the first one that I'm looking at is like, what annoys you most about humanity? <laughs> what annoys me most about humanity? I mean, it's such, it's a broad um, question. And there's the obvious stuff you know sometimes you'll turn on some news channels and there's some be some people on there and you go huh feels like your actions are contradictory to what you're saying with your words um and that's pretty frustrating but in general you know i try not to uh throw a lot of judgment out there into uh, the we, world. That's not what we were looking for. Like, I have a thing about leggings. I don't understand leggings. I don't know that it's, like, the thing that I find is most wrong with humanity, but, like, to me, like, I come from a time when, like, leggings were what you wore at the gym. So it just takes getting used to, for me, to be out in the world in the last, say, 10 to 15 years when, like, everyone's just in their yoga clothes all the time. It's a lot of information. But we just thought Max might be the kind of person who's like, you know what bugs me? When they run out of cocoa powder at the Starbucks. Like, I don't know. Oh, for sure. I mean, look, <laughs> although, you know, I'm so tired all the time. I just have stopped giving a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, like, I just, I'm so fucking tired. I got these two kids. I'm trying to like raise <laughs> That's, that's a, fair. That's and a anything good place else to in be, the world, actually. I'm just like, oh, fuck. You know what's you know, annoying? This podcast. No, gosh, please. Um, the Knicks can be annoying. <laughs> um, I feel like I, I feel like I like a white T-shirt, but as soon as I get it, it I spill something on it. I only say this because I got a really nice white T-shirt. I, I got a gift certificate to a place that I liked. And I said, I'm going to buy like a, a nice white T-shirt. It's going gonna, it's gonna to fit good. I'm going to like it. And, um, and sure enough, it did. Within a day, I spilled something on it and I can't get it out. And so I colored over it with markers to like make a design on it to make it look cool. And I was doing this last night and my daughter was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Next question. Moving on. Uh, complaints that your wife has about you. Yeah, what's something that your wife is annoyed with you about? Now this is a list. I'm taking notes. <laughs> oh my God, where do I begin? Do you leave the cupboards open after you take something out of them? No, but she does. Yeah, she does. And oh, does it bother me? Whoa, we went from I'm feeling so tired. I have to raise these children to I forgot fucking... about it. You got it. <sighs> okay, so what do you do that she feels that way about? I probably close the cupboards too often. <laughs> it's like it's like that's really that's I wasn't the, done in there. Like in that's the what I say to people. Putting the dishes away from the dishwasher, you're like closing the cupboards. Are you neat? Very. Oh. And then and then I'm like, I'll get everything I'll get everything tidy in the house and be like, that's ah, foof. And she'll go, is it clean enough for you? <laughs> Can you relax now? Or, or is it, or it's more like this. Oh, are you, oh, are you, are you tired now? Cause nobody, nobody asked you to do all that stuff. But that's the most fun is to do things. No one asks you and then make them feel bad that you did it. It's my favorite activity. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what level of neat are you? Are you like a fold your socks in the drawer all lined up nice? No, it's not that bad. I just I need the kitchen. I can't I can't go to sleep unless the kitchen's clean. Got it. And I have to make my bed every morning. I gotta make oh. the beds every morning. Um, I can't leave the house unless the kitchen and the beds are made, and I can't go to sleep unless the kitchen's clean. I, for some people, they may not operate like that, but for me, and it sounds like for you as well, it it makes more room in my head when that clutter is not around. I think there's a whole topic here around spirituality and, and consciousness. Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? <laughs> Jonathan just went deep right there. Yeah, big time. Do you believe in God? Um, like, do you have a God of your understanding? For, sh for sure. Yeah. You have a God of your understanding. Did you have that as a child? Like, did you grow up as like, 
I believe in God? Or has it changed as you got older? No, I think I was really searching for it for a long time. Um, and it wasn't until I got sober that I found that I was able to connect to something. Um, and then through recovery, really found a God of my understanding. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a spiritual based program. Um, and so being able to connect to something and find some spirituality in your life and having it grow over time has really been probably the most meaningful part of my life. Huh. And was, uh, I, I don't know the timeline sort of of your universe is, was that something you found before you had kids? Um, or was this in the time that they've been alive? It was before I had children. Um, thank God. Uh, yeah, I had a, I had a, I, I felt like I had enough of a spiritual foundation um, when we had children that it allowed me to really um, it gave me the perspective that I needed because I don't think had I not had I not had that whew, parenting would have been a much different experience. Mm -hmm. You know, just from my interaction, like you're a very you're a very funny person. You like making people laugh. There's a there's a real comfort, I think, uh, you know, uh, there's a real comfort for you, I think, in in being a performer and in being funny. I Meaning it's it it comes very, very, you know, it's very effortless. And, um, you know, I think it's part of your charm. Like the the word is Hamish. Like there's a real Hamish equality about you. You feel like, you know, you, you know, you're it's a friendly kind of humor that that you have and a, a way about you. Um, I'm curious, you know, before sobriety, were you funny different? <laughs> oh, great question. Um, I wish I knew. Mm. I think I think I think at times I was funny the same. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think there were a lot of times where I probably thought I was funny the same and, and probably was not. Um, this is something that, you know, I, I ask myself when I think of kind of my own journey. Um, and, you know, I've, I've sat in um, I, I've sat in rooms where we, you know, talk about the things we do to, you know, kind of fill, you know, that sort of God shaped hole. What do you feel you were looking to fill? Like, can you put your finger on it? Meaning like the problem is never the thing. The problem is what you feel when you turn to the thing to not feel that. <laughs> So, you know, like, I'm, I'm curious if there's like one thing that you put your finger on. Yeah, I mean, it, for sure, it was it was a, a lack of connection. I thought I was alone and I thought I had to do this all by myself. And I was convinced of that. Um, I thought anything that was affecting me in life, my feelings, they were they were all unique to me. And I was uh, very specifically different. And um, and that really took me to a dark place because, you know, you spend enough time there and it gets really lonely and scary. And it wasn't until uh, I was able to ask for help and 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 find a group and eventually a connection to something bigger than myself. Um, did I then feel connected to not only the group, but to the world and to the people around me? And then life got a lot easier. And when I get disconnected from that is when life gets uh, challenging. And I've got to continue to remind myself to dial back in and and connect and be a part of as, a, as opposed to living over here outside of hmm. very well said are you open to just like talking a little bit about what that practice is for you to be feel connected to something greater than yourself like is it a daily practice is it meditation <laughs> one of my big problems is um i'm very forgetful so um you know i'll i'll forget the work that i have to do to stay connected i sometimes will forget that it is not only just a daily thing for me, but it is a sometimes a several times a day thing for me. Um, and so, you know, I got, I, there's, there's work to be done. And I think part of that work is constantly checking in on myself, you know, and having, you know, having been sober for a long time now, it's been close to 17, uh, 
17 years, I think. Oh. I know, I, I know when I'm, I know when I'm off and I know, I know how I, I usually know how I get off or what might pull me out of it, um, out of some sort of connection. And, uh, and luckily I also know how to get back. And it's usually as simple as just picking up the phone and having a conversation, um, you know, not choosing not to react when I, when I probably, when I, when my instinct is to, um, engage and taking, I always say to my, say to friends of mine, I'll be like, you know, sometimes I want to start a sentence with, I think, or I feel, Mm -hmm. um, and that's always a sign that I'm about to make a mistake. Mm. And so I'll want to run those ideas by somebody before you know, I run them by my wife or my kids <laughs> or my coworkers. <laughs> no, it's it's important. And what I hear when when you're talking is like knowing where home base is, both psychologically and emotionally. Yeah, and I think it's like a learned humility in that woof, I am a flawed person. I have to really check myself. And I have to stay within what I know works for me, even though I'm convinced on some days there's something else out there. Should we talk about comedy? Let's talk about comedy. What are you laughing at these days? What's making you laugh? <laughs> My son is is really funny right now. And it's just, it's a lot of like dick and balls. Yeah, they love him. And... I'm going to be honest. They really, they get me. They get me every time. I think that they're not going to. And sometimes I'm like, hey, man, I really wish there was some, like a different area you could explore in terms of humor. Um, and and uh, and and then as soon as I think that, he'll come back with some other like D's nuts yep. jokes. Yep. And man, they get me every time. There's a handful of comedians too. I I I really like I appreciate this sort of um focus on stand up right now. Mm-hmm. So like Nick Nick Kroll, yep. Mulaney, Chelsea Peretti. Yep. Um I just watched Nick's show the other night and I just was like, Thank God. Yeah. Yeah, we just it's started just, very, very it's good stand up. Ju- Right now. Yeah, it's just the right amount of like really smart humor and also silly. Yeah. Max, where can we direct people for them to find things about you if you'd like them to learn more about you? Oh God. It, it, well, you can just you can Google it and get all sorts of information I meant, about me. Do you me. like to um, do, do Instagram? We know you had a TikTok viral I'm moment. On it, I'm on I'm on Instagram um for sure. Uh my daughter's forcing me to do TikToks these days. <laughs> uh and um I've got a I've got a children's book coming out that I'm very excited about. Tell us more. Uh I wrote the first book, this one. I don't want to read this book, <laughs> which is great. Um it's illustrated by Mike Lowry. It's all about not wanting to it's it's for reluctant readers or kids who have, you know, it's for any type of reader, but if you have a reluctant reader or someone who's struggling with reading, um, it's all the reasons why you maybe don't want to read a book. And by the end of the book, you've read a book. Sweet. And then the, we felt like there was more to say after the first one. So we did another one, which is maybe a little bit more of a fun take on it. Uh, and it's called, this book is not a present. It walks you through the, in a fun way, the experience of opening up a gift and realizing it's a book. And for, for a child who might be disappointed if that's what, what they were given. Awesome. I don't know when this is airing, but you are coming up on the 100th episode of your current show. We should That's right. give a shout out. Yeah, The Neighborhood. Uh, we are rallying towards 100. I don't know what I'll do when we celebrate I 100 mean, episodes. I mean, James Gordon wanted to know what you're going to do. Um, this is, this is you, you have a, a lucrative career on many seasons of shows before this. Um, that's a really, it's a very sweet run. And Cedric the Entertainer is on The Neighborhood, in case people don't know. Not just you. Yeah, Cedric is the greatest. He's the lead of our show. He's, he's, uh, he really is like, he's, he's everything you want in a number one um, on a show. Uh, I remember when we were doing live audience shows before COVID, I remember getting in there. And, you know, the show at, at, at the beginning was, I mean, it was definitely Cedric's show, but it was a two-hander and the posters were he and I. And 
I was like, okay, well, this is a real partnership. And I still think it is. But when we started the show and we were in, an aud- in front of an audience, the way he would just command the audience and get them engaged in what we were doing that mm. and doing and walking them through everything, I was like, whatever this guy wants, man, I will do. <laughs> this is, I am so happily the number two. If he wants me to be the number three, I'll be the number three on this thing. I don't care. Like, this is the greatest. He's he really is a true leader on a set and I'm and also the funniest guy ever. And so it's been such a great experience working with him. And and if there's any reason why we're hitting 100 episodes, it's because of him. It was very spontaneous of me to, first of all, have a texting relationship with Max at all after our James Corden Rosh Hashanah party. It was New Year, New You. New Year, New Me. It was very spontaneous for us to just like make a list of questions that we'd love to hear him riff on. And I'm going to go ahead and say, I really enjoyed talking to him and he shared some really beautiful things with us. He also is mesmerizingly attractive when you're looking at him from this angle. Like when I was on the couch with him, like, yeah, he's handsome, but like looking at him this way, I was like the eyebrows and the cheek of the chin. It's like so much smiling on that guy. He's very, very attractive eyes. I thought we could circle back in this uh, conclusion on checking in on myself and the practice of feeling connected. You're starting to move away from the mic, so I, maybe you don't want to have that conversation. No, I'm actually creating movement, which for me is very soothing. And I was actually at the um, somatic person that I'm um, doing work with today, and she was talking about how everybody has a different sense of comfort and safety. Mm-hmm. And for some people, movement is necessary for safety, and for other people, it's not. Um, but I think, you know, generally speaking, I think what what Max was talking about and I think what you and I talk about is, you know, in order to know what feels safe, you have to kind of know your needs first. And if you start doing all the things that other people tell you to do, it's actually not going to work. And I was having this conversation actually with my my older son. I was explaining to him, um, just talking about the different changes we go through as adults and that like I'm still in therapy doing work where I'm like learning new things about myself, like things I really didn't understand, like finally clicking together. I'm like, I did not know I'd have to learn so much about myself this late in life. I thought I would just be enjoying my life by this time instead of like, what is this? Why am I doing this? Why am I mean to this person? Why am I snapping at Jonathan? You know, and and I said that to Miles. I said, you know, like it's a whole process of discovering yourself. And if someone tr- would have tried to tell me the things that I'm doing now, if they would have told me to do that 30 years ago, it wouldn't have worked. It didn't work. Like you have to come to know yourself in the context that you're actually in. I wish that when you first told me that I need to, you know, stop using overhead lights past 9 p.m., like I wish I would have listened to you. But sometimes we need to hear the message different ways and be at different points in our life to finally be like, this is who I am and therefore, this is how I know when I'm off kilter. Like I didn't know, my older son said to me, he's like, I didn't even realize my stomach gets upset when I'm nervous, right? It's like, it takes living. And being in different situations to be like, oh, that's not just like take a pill. That's like, whoa, something's up. And for me, it's like, it's my nail biting. It's my sleep. It's nightmares. It's, you know, it's whatever it is. Those are all indications that something's, you know, out of whack. We've all had a different acclimation to what that normal baseline is. So when we're reestablishing, hey, what is safety feel like? Right. If you've never really felt safe, then you kind of, you drop in. You're like, well, I don't know where to return to. And so what I like about this idea of home base, even if you're someone who has never really felt that safe, by starting to establish what is safety Mm -hmm. and then deepening that to feel more and more levels of safety, uh, you begin to know when you're off kilter because you know where to return to. What I really love that Max said, though, was he talked about home base also being, being accountable. And that's something that I think is not something we talk about a lot. And when the the three of us, we took a quiz that talked about, you know, like personality types. And a lot of the questions were about accountability. Like, can you hold to something if you're not having to report on it? And like, for me, like, I love a checklist. I love a thing. I love homework. Like, that's why cognitive behavioral therapy is interesting to me because it's like, do this, do that, the other. And when I saw this somatic therapist woman today, we did three specific exercises and she wrote them on a piece of paper. And she, this is this was where it started to go wrong. She's like, but you can really just- No, decide. you can't. So what she was saying was like, for some people, 
whatever order, whatever feel. No, and I was you like, need us. I should do this for this many minutes. You, and I should do it this and, number of times a day. But once she heard that, once I said that, she's like, got it. I get who you are. Please do these every day before you go to bed. I was like, she's like, got it. Everybody's different. But for me, like, I need that accountability. Yeah. What Max was talking about is, especially when you find so sobriety or, or sanity, you know, of whatever variety, the purpose of things like 12-step programs, um, support groups, is that you have people who get to know all about you, meaning in little bits. And for some people, it takes years to reveal, you know, who they are to, to a group of people because many people are like, I'm not a group person. Like, I was that way too. And to some extent, I still am. But to have a group of people who've heard your shit, who know what it looks like when you're faking it, like, that's the home that you come back to, right? And that's, you know, in, in programs where you are paired with, a, where you choose a sponsor or, you know, you you choose someone to work with, that's who that person is. The person you, you got one person you can't bullshit, you know? Because I bullshit you all the time. I do. Meaning, like, I'll act like I'm okay when I'm not. I'll act like I don't want to hug when I do. I'll act like I don't want to be around you when what I really need is for someone to be around me, you know? Mm. And, like, that I... I can't always be honest, but to have a person that I know I can call, I can text and say, it's like they've given me the vocabulary to be able to say, I'm feeling shitty. I'm withholding from the person who I actually need comfort from. I want to blow things up. And to have someone say, I know what you're like when it's like that. And here are the things I'm going to remind you to do and not do. Right. Don't act. Don't start meaningful conversations after 9 p.m. Some people say 10. I push it to nine. Don't eat over it. Don't numb out, you know? Yeah, I have a pattern that you and I have been talking about for a while, um, which is that everything is a catastrophe and that type of thinking spirals really quickly. It's like one thing doesn't go right and then another thing and this person isn't going to ever call back and that person isn't going to go and then I'm going to lose every dollar I've ever had in my life and the fires are going to burn my house down and I'm well, going to have no place to live. And and also what I've noticed and look everybody's different, you know, the people that you're that you most frequently that you work with, that you interact with, you really want to to disappear. You want to have no needs, you know, meaning like meaning like I, I don't need this. I don't need that. This person let me, you know, and it's like a pulling away. And then for me, that just triggers like, but come here. Like, I want to make it better, right? But to connect this back to this idea of checking in is that the other day I had a trigger. Totally. And I was able to say to you in the moment, this is what's happening. And I know right now I am not having sane thinking. And I I'm did having... not try and fix it. A little bit I tried. <laughs> and I, I said, I like, I, it used to be that when that would happen, I would be like, this is true and that's true and I'm taking action and I need to do this. With your angry little fingers. I'm typing this. Got to reach out and fix the thing. And what did thing. I say to you? As he's typing, though, that when this happened, he was angrily typing. I'm like, would you like to give that a three-second pause? How about a three-minute pause? No. Send. <laughs> like, it's gone. However, <laughs> after the sending. But then you stopped. I stopped. And I was like, I am totally not okay right now. And what do I need to do to try and come back to a sense of normal. Sit in synagogue for four hours. No, that wasn't it. I needed to take a walk. I needed to clear my head. I needed to be somewhat distracted. So, because I knew my mind is, if I have nothing right now, it's not numbing out, but it's like, if I right. allow my mind to do nothing else right that, now and be yeah. in silence, I'm going to ruminate. There's yeah. no way that, that, that I... That is numbing out. It really is. Meaning ruminating is its own... It's its own cycle of addictive, you know, behavior also. And I had enough perspective that I'm like, I know that I can't fix this right now. And I know that there's information that I need in order to take a next step that I don't have right now. So what do I need to do until I get that information in order to stay sane? And that was, I need to listen to a podcast. I was feeling out of control. I was feeling anger. I was feeling resentment. I was feeling injustice. Uh, I was feeling a huge amount of sadness. It was like... And, and I, even I could feel my anger and I would be like, yes, I'm angry. And it's not only about the situation. Yeah. I could feel the sadness underneath the situation. And I said to you, I'm like, I need to go home and cry. I'm in a public space right now. And all I feel is overwhelmed. And I had to like navigate through that. And I would say that even two years ago, even a year and a half ago, that state probably could have lasted 
days, even a week. It could it could have like six months ago, and it possibly did, yesterday. No. It, it didn't disturb my sleep last night. I slept well, and today it didn't consume my whole day, and I was able to get the information that I needed. Uh, and while I am still annoyed by the situation, it was a different level of checking in, and I do attribute that to sort of saying, wait a second, I know that I'm straying from home base because I've tried as much as I can, not perfect at it, to practice, oh, this level of obsession, anger, annoyance is not a natural state. It's not where I have to live all the time. Right. And so when it comes up, it's easier to recognize. How do you feel? I mean, I feel really a lot more optimistic than I did even 24 hours ago. And to me, it's not about not getting thrown off our game. It's about how quickly we're able to bounce back or to reorient ourselves. Do you feel proud of yourself? Um, I think I have a hard time with pride in general. I feel a sense of, I feel a sense of, yeah, I can, I don't know. It does. It's not like, oh, you did a good job. It's like, oh, thank goodness that whatever those demons are, which sometimes emotions, especially when they come over up in such in, with such intensity can feel like, holy, how am I, you know, mm -hmm. navigating this? They don't have to feel like they're going to overtake me. And I think in the past, sometimes in my past, when I have a really strong emotion like that, it's like, oh, it consumes everything. Mm -hmm. You actually, you said you felt like, like hurting something. Like you, I have a punching bag in my garage. Oh yeah. Were, yeah. I, like I felt when, when it initially happened, it was like sort of the trigger was like seven o'clock at yeah, night yeah. and we got back around nine 30 or so. And mm -hmm. like, I, I couldn't get it out. I couldn't like shake it, move it. And I was like, yeah, I needed to kick and punch and like have a very physical, um, expression of it. Were you able to enjoy my singing that evening? No. Would you like to listen to it again? What is the right answer? From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction one. And now she's going to break down.